Welcome to the first of the four squat tutorials this afternoon. Uh, fittingly, it's a, it's a tutorial on probability, one of the most basic measures or metric or variables in our field. Which of those it is, uh, you will soon be hearing. Armando Machado will explain what probability is, but I'd like to preempt that by suggesting it's one of five things. First of all, it's relative frequency, of course. You flip, what's the probability of flipping a coin uh, heads, if it's a fair coin, it's 0.5. How do you know? You flip it 100 times and you find it's fallen heads up 50 out of the 100. But that's not a probability, that's a count. You know exactly what happened on each trial. Probability is not there. Where is it? Maybe it's in the fact that you think it's going to, for the next 100 trials, do the same. That's not a probability either. It will or it won't. You're talking more about subjective beliefs. So maybe that's the second idea of what probability is. So, uh, the, the strength of willingness to believe in things. And you do that by sampling scenarios. But if that's the case, everybody's got a different sense of the scenarios, a different inside information. That's why they handicap. So if all probabilities are subjective. There's no probability we can assign to events. That's not so good either. Well, maybe uh, probability is a measure of our ignorance, or ignorance of the controlling variables. If we knew what those variables were, we'd know what the outcome is. So it doesn't ma ma measure a phenomenon. It measures our ignorance. Well, that's a bit of a problem if you want to go ahead and do models with it. Maybe what it is is just a modeling system, a grammar or a logic of models that you can apply to things like coins, but we're lucky it applies to behavior too. Yes, it's certainly that, but maybe it's more than that. What I think probability is, it's the amount of surprise you don't show when something happens. And it's no surprise, it should come as no surprise, that there is no person who can better explain what I just said, plus a lot more about probability than Armando Machado, the expert of probability, the uh, president outgoing of Squab, and the person I defer to for the rest of the hour. Uh, if you have questions, great. If it's things you didn't hear or understand, please ask them. But if it's just elaborations, wait until the end of the uh, 45 minutes, and we'll have a lot of time for questions. Armando Machado. Thanks, Peter. Okay, um, this is an invitation to probability. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, is to um, illustrate a few techniques that I found very useful uh, in understanding some uh, problems of psychology I've applied. And they are sufficiently general uh, that they have uh, wide applicability, and I'd like to, to, to talk about them. Uh, and I think this is best done by example. Um, probability is a few general principles and a lot of tricks. And so we need to understand a few principles and practice with the tricks. And uh, um, consider the following problem. In the jargon of probability um, textbooks, is called the occupan occupancy problem. Suppose that you have uh, five distinct balls, three urns, three bags, when placing five different balls randomly into the three different urns, what's the probability that no urn is left empty? Well, uh, one way to compute this probability is to count the number of favorable cases. We have two examples here. No urn is empty. And we and count the number of total cases, which, are, which is the favorable plus the unfavorable. And we have an example of unfavorable case here. Well, this probability is 0 0.617. We will learn today how to compute this sort of probability. Here's another example. Uh, so coupons in cereal boxes, this is a very favorite. It's almost in every introductory textbook on probability, for good reason. Um, as we will see at the end, coupons in cereal boxes have words printed on them. With one coupon per box, how many boxes on the average are required to make a complete set? In this example, I have eight types of coupons. Each one has a word printed on it. And you need to get one of each to complete the sentence. And the sentence says, you have just uh, won a trip to Mexico. Uh, now, you're buying them. You don't know what, which coupon is inside. On the average, how many boxes do you need to buy to get a full set? And the answer is 21.7. We will learn today how to do this. Uh, let's get a little bit closer to our field. Uh, 
consider the following situation. On each trial, a stat pigeon, it's a new breed of pigeons called Columba neuringia, uh, chooses eight times which of two keys to pack. For example, on trial one, this stat pigeon has chosen left, 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 and right, left, right, 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 right. We do it 50 times on one session, okay? And notice that some sequences are different, differ, some are repeats. Uh, and the question is, assuming random choices, what's the expected number of different sequences emitted during a 50 trial session? So you look at these 50 sequences, some are repeats, some are unique, uh, and you ask how many different sequences are there? Uh, a measure, if you want, of the variability in the behavior. Well, based on computer simulations, Page and Euringer in 85 report 45 sequences on the average are distinct. Can we derive this number? We'll do that today. Um, let's change to a different situation. We have an eight arm radial arm maze. On each trial, our stat rat chooses randomly one of the eight arms of the maze. This guy has no memory. Uh, so on each trial, uh, just uh, samples one of the eight arms randomly. One question that we can ask is, what is the mean number of trials needed to visit all eight arms? Okay? Um, here's a slightly different question. Now, notice that here, the number of trials may be eight, may be nine, may be ten. We're asking for the average number. Here is a different question. What is the mean number of different arms visited during eight trials? Now we're fixing the trials. We're saying, okay, you have eight chances. How many different arms? Alton and Schlossberg in 78 say in their paper it's 5.25 and they don't show how they got this number. We will learn today how to get this number, okay? And in the process, we'll enjoy this, I hope, and learn a few techniques. But first, I need to review, it's a sort of preliminary, setting the stage for what's coming up next. I need to review things that you probably learned uh, uh, in high school or first year of college. If you haven't applied, maybe you forgot. So let's uh, remember what combinations are. Uh, suppose, so the first uh, three things I will do is to review three concepts. One is combinations. Suppose you have uh, five different balls. Uh, how many sets of three can you form? Uh, and the order of the balls is irrelevant. So, in this, more generally, if you have n balls and you, you want to form groups of k, how many can you form? Uh, notice that there is an important constraint. I'm considering this uh, yellow, red, and green. Uh, all these permutations are considered the same thing. It's just the order that uh, is changing, and I don't want to count this as six. This counts as one. Given that, uh, how many cases can I, um, can I have? And this number is combinations of n, k at a time, and the, it has this formula, n factorial. This means n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 and down to 1, okay? Uh, divided by n minus k factorial, k factorial. Um, so in this case, we have five balls, three at a time. So you plug the numbers, and then when you do the math, you get to 10, okay? So... This is just to refresh the memory. The other thing I want to refresh our memory is the concept of average or expectation. Uh, to illustrate that, imagine that uh, you have an honest coin. You flip the coin. Probability of heads is one half, tails one half. Now, let's say you flip it three times. And you are interested in the total number of heads at the end of the third uh, flip. Well. You see that this number can vary. So we call this number x, and x is a random variable. Two things are important for a random variable. You need to know which numbers can it take. Well, in this case, well, it can, take ze can be 0. The outcomes were all tails. Can be 1, can be 2, or can be 3. This is the domain of the random variable. The other thing is, for each one of these numbers, 0, 1, what's the probability? of getting that. Well, uh, in this case, for example, it's just one-half times one-half times one-half would be one-eighth. Now, given the domain, the number of possible values, the possible values that a random variable can take and the probability of each one, we find its expectation or mean or the average value. 
And the formula to remind you, you just grab the number that it can take and multiply or weight it by its probability and you do for all possible outcomes and you get the expected value of x. So, we think about this. Uh, it can be zero and that must be weighted by its probability. It's one eight. One can happen in three out of eight times, okay? One is here, there, three. The probability of getting a one is three eighths and then you do this and you get to the result that you have expected. In three flips, on the average, I'll get 1.5 heads. Okay? Now, there is a fundamental property, extremely important property of expectation. And it's illustrated here. Suppose that you have two random variables, x and y, and you add them. And you get z. Now, it just happens that, uh, not just happens, but I will not prove it here, so take for granted or remember what you've learned before. The expected value of the sum is equal to the sum of the expected values. So this means the expectation is a linear operator. Okay? So when you have two random variables, or three, or ten, and you want to compute the average of their sum, you just compute the average of each one and sum the averages. Okay? So that's a fundamental property that we'll be using a lot. Now, the final thing that I want, and this uh, some of you may not have learned, so that's uh, an occasion to do that, it's the expected number of trials to success. Uh, here's the problem. Suppose on each trial an event occurs with probability p. Think in a concrete way, for example, you toss a die and you're interested in the outcome. Look, the face that I see has five spots. We all know if the die is fair, the probability will be one in six. Okay? When I toss it, I can get the five right away or I, I may have to toss it twice or three times. On the average, how many trials do I, need to, uh, do I need in order to get number five, the face with number five, okay? Uh, there are many ways to compute this. Some people intuitively know what the, out, what the result is. Let's prove it. And in this proof, we have one of those fundamental techniques of probability. We call it expectation by conditioning. We are going to condition uh, on the outcome of the first trial but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's define, let's say that E is the expected number we're trying to get, trying to find, okay? Expected number of trials until I get the event. Well, what happens on the first trial? Either I get the event or I don't. If I get the event, which occurs with probability P, then I only needed one trial. So E is equal to one. What happens if I don't get, and that's the crucial step of the argument, what happens if I don't get? the event. I didn't see the 5. Okay, this occurs with probability 1 minus p. But if that happens, the expected number of trials until I get it is just 1 plus what it was before. Okay? And that's the crucial observation. So, I go back to square one because uh, uh, the probability is the same, the events are independent. Uh, so, I can compute the expected value in the following way. Look, with probability p, I get the event. I'm just applying the formula you saw before. With probability p, I get the event, and then I only needed one trial. Well, with probability 1 minus p, I didn't get it, and in this case, the expectation just increased by 1. So, well, I will spare you the algebra. When we solve this equation for e, we get 1 over p. Now, this, for many people, is highly intuitive because uh, for example, if you're interested in, the, in a coin, the probability of getting heads is one half. How many trials do you need before, on the average, before you get heads? Well, it's two. One over one half. Okay? So you just take the reciprocal. And for the die, the probability, the expected number of trials before I see a face with the five dots is six. It's one over one six. Okay? That's the end of this preliminary stuff. Now let's get to some interesting uh, problems. Okay, let's try to find this one. On each trial, our rat chooses randomly one of the eight arms of the maze. In probability, it's fundamental to have very clear thinking and define your variables carefully. That is many times half of the way to the solution. Lots of terminology, lots of symbols. If you control them, they will be your friends. If you don't control them, they get to be wild beasts, okay? And confuse more than illuminate. 
So, uh, let T be the total number of trials needed to visit all arms. T for total. Remember this. Um, what is the expected value of T? How many trials, on the average, does this stat rat need to visit all eight arms? Okay? We know one thing right away. It must be greater than seven. I will need at least eight trials to visit eight arms. So whatever answer we get must be bigger than seven. Um, so here's the problem. What is the expected value of T? Always good to start with an example. Suppose that a stat rat visits the arms in this order. Um, I have numbered them here, as you can see, and I have uh, printed in red ink uh, an arm that it has visited for the first time. Okay, so black means a repeat here. So the rat visited two, uh, arms two, five, three, they're all new. Three is a repeat, so it's in black. So I keep going until I, I see uh, all eight arms visited. So when uh, the rat visited arm number seven here, it's printed with green. I don't know if you can see it. But then it has visited all of them. In this particular case, T was 15. So T is going to be a random variable, and we want to find its expected value. Now, this may sound like paradoxical, but we're going to use, that's another technique that we're going to learn here, or remember, uh, we will use a historical but forward approach. As you can imagine, there is historical backward approach. We will use the forward approach. And again, in these probability problems, many times there is a framing way, a way to look at the problem that is the solution, basically. That's the key step, and I don't know how to teach this. Many, t many times I don't get it. It's the way to conceive the problem. Uh, a r one good rule of thumb is divide to conquer. Sometimes I cannot figure out that, probability, that expectation right away. So the idea is, can you break the problem in parts and figure out uh, the solution to each one of the parts and then somehow combine? It's very vague, but um, that's where intuition and lots of training come to solve these types of problems. So the key step is this. We're going to define a new variable, and we call it x sub j. When you see a random variable with a subscript, we need to understand two things. What does it stand for? What's the subscript doing? So let's go by parts. What is x? x is the number of trials taken by the rat to visit a new arm. Complex definition, but it will help us in a moment. So number of trials to visit a new arm. So what's the subscript doing? It's going to be a condition. Given that, it has already visited j arms. So if your rat has visited j arms, how many new trials did it need to visit a new arm? Okay? Again, let's see how this works with a concrete example. Returning to that stat rat that shows the... Whoops, I'm pointing to the computer. Um, visited the arms in this order. Let's see how the x sub j, which is the key to the problem, is, the, is used. Well, before the first trial, the rat has not visited any arm. So j, the number of, of arms already visited, is zero, right? So, on trial one, the uh, rat visited arm number two. It's a new arm. So, if you, I just repeat it here. So, x sub zero equals one. Again, what is x sub zero? Number of trials needed to visit a new arm, given that I had visited zero arms. Well, I just needed one. So, x sub zero is equal to one. What about now, on the next trial? Well, j now is 1, because I've already visited 1. The red shows arm number 5. That's a new one. So when I, uh, the red had visited one new arm, it needed one, only one trial to visit a new arm, the second one. So x sub 1 is equal to 1. Is that OK? Well, we could go one more round. Again. Uh, it visited a new arm, so x sub 2 means when uh, the rat had visited two arms, how many trials did it take to visit a new arm that it had not visited, of course. So, now, more interesting is a repeat. What happens in a repeat? Notice that when the rat had visited three arms, the next trial visited arm number three. Well, this is old, so uh, I, don't, I keep counting. I keep counting. So, x sub j is going to be a counter, okay? Now, on the next trial, whoops, 
Repeat it again. So this is not a new arm. So I just keep counting. Finally, on trial six, it visited a new arm. So here's why is x sub 3 equals 3? Well, because when the rat had visited three arms, to visit the fourth new arm, he took three trials. One, two, and three. So x sub 3 is 3. Okay? Why am I going to all this complexity? Well, I've just uh, shortened the table. Because, I'm sorry. Because if we add these numbers, 1, 1, x sub 0, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 7, if I add these numbers, I get 15. So the total number of trials, and you, you can think about that in, intuitively. OK, in order to visit eight arms, I have to visit one of them first, and then the second new, and then the third new. And that's what x sub j is doing. It's counting the number of trials before I get something new. I visit something new. Now, this means that uh, if t, the total number of trials, is just the sum of x sub 0, x sub 1, up to x sub 7, the expected value is, applying that formula that we learned before, is the sum of the expected values. But if it seems that we're going backwards. I have the problem of finding the expected value of one variable. And now I have to find the expected value of eight variables. So am I not making it more complex? No. Sometimes you need to go downhill before going uphill. Uh, each one will be easier. So if we could somehow figure out this uh, simpler problem, we would be done. So if we, let's try to find the expected value of x sub j. This means that when the rat had visited j arms, how many trials did it need on average to visit a new one? It's always good to start with an example. We don't need to be reminded of Daniel Kahneman's um, and Tversky's research to understand how easy it is to trip on probability. The only person that doesn't trip is the person that doesn't walk. Okay, so you have to tolerate mistakes here. Um, okay, suppose that the rat had visited three arms. So this means, and they are here in red, this means that five arms have not been visited in black. So I ask, what is the probability of visiting a new arm? Well, the probability of visiting a new arm is the rat has five chances out of eight, so that's five eighths. Um, What's the expected number? That's the probability. What's the expected number? That's something we have just learned. When we have an event with probability p, the expected number to get the event is 1 over p. So we just reverse this, and we get, uh, in this case, 8 over 5. So more generally, if I visited j arms, I have not visited 8 minus j. So the probability of visiting a new arm, favorable cases, divided by total cases. Expected number, just flip them around. So what is expected value of x sub j? In, this, in the particular case, uh, when j is 3, it's 8 fifths, when, uh, for the more general case, is 8 over 8 minus j. The good thing about these general cases is that they, gave, they give us the solution to x sub 0, x sub 1, because I just plug 0 here, I get, uh, I'm sorry, here, and I get uh, the expected value of x sub 0. If I plug 1, so I have the general formula, basically. So here it is. I'm repeating the expected value of t is just the sum of the expectations. Now I plug the numbers, uh, the j value in the formula, and I get 8 over 8 minus 0. This is the average number of trials to visit the first new arm. Well, this gives 1. Of course, the rat on the first trial always visits a new arm. So this is 1. The expected number of trials to visit the second arm is 8 over 7. And you need to sum these numbers, and you get 21.74. Now, it's always nice to try to generalize. Imagine now that you have an n-arm radial arm maze. Maybe it's very big, uh, n arm. Well, the nice thing about when you have the general solution is that it's the same thing, except that instead of a, having eight arms, you have n. Plug in the numbers, and you get this. The expected number is 1 plus n over n minus 1 plus n over n minus 2. And you factor out n, and you get this nice result. 
It's the number of arms in the maze times the sum of these famous numbers. 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3. These are called harmonic numbers. Now, if n is reasonably large, and if you remember a few things about your calculus uh, course, you know that when you're adding things that are very small and you're adding a bunch of them, it's like integrating. Okay, so uh, this may be approximated by an integral, which is just a sum of tiny things, a, lar a sum of a large number of terms, each one very small. Well, these numbers are getting pretty small. Think about 100s and things like this. The second thing is that, so this is approximately an integral of something, what? 1 over x. And you may remember in your calculus that 1 over x gives you the log function. So we get the approximation is basically n times log of n, plus some things like Euler constant. I will not deal with it. And you have the case here. Uh, so if you notice that the general thing, the, 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 the good thing about the generalization is that, okay, a coin is just a radial arm maze with two arms. The same problem. Uh, uh, a die is just a radial arm maze with six arms. And, well, the typical has eight arms, but when you plug uh, here the, the number of arms, and you get for a coin three, and then for the eight arms, uh, radial arm maze, 21.7. It is always good to check your results. Let's check this one because it's easier. I, f I am... Uh, the problem for the coin, the equivalent problem is this. How many trials on average do you need to see both faces? Well, you flip the coin once, you're going to see one face. So, on the first trial, you always see a new face. Then, there is only one face left. That face occurs with probability one half. So, the number of trials on average that you need to see that second face is two. Two plus the first initial trial gives you three. And it's, I'm glad that the formula gives you three. Okay? So we have found the solution to this problem. Summary. Very powerful technique is when you have these multi-stage experiments to break the problem in chunks, compute the expectation of each chunk, and then add the expectations. Okay? Now we're going to embark on a longer journey. This is a tougher problem. Uh, that very often in probability what scares people and what is, makes the problem difficult is not each step. Each step is okay, but you have many steps before you can reach the solution. Okay, so sometimes we don't have the persistence, or we don't persevere enough to get to the end. Um, bear with me, we'll get there. We're trying to solve a harder problem. Suppose now that uh, D, I'm going to called D, the number of distinct arms, different arms, that the animal visits on N trials. So I'm going to fix N. Let's say I give the rat eight opportunities. How many different arms does it visit? Well, it could be one, it could be two. If N is bigger than eight, I give it more than eight trials. D can vary from one to eight. This is how many, tri many arms the, the animal can visit. So we're trying to find the, 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 uh, what the probability that this random variable, d, equals k. What is the probability that after n trials the guy has visited, for example, only three arms, or only one, or only seven? Okay, that's our k. This is a tougher problem. So this is our general problem. This guide us for the next... Uh, uh, 15 minutes, uh, I hope. Um, the solution goes like this. We're going to break the problem to give examples and see if we can see uh, where we're going. Uh, I don't have a recipe for this part. Um, fix attention on the K-specific arms. For example, on arms 1, 2, and 3. Okay? Determine the probability that these arms constitute the set of arms visited during the end trials. In other words, if we can figure out the probability that the guy visited these K arms, these three in this case, and only those, and then multiply that by the number of sets of K distinct arms. Multiply the probability found here by combinations of A, because I chose those three arms. I have eight. 
I could have picked another three, uh, another group of three. How many groups of three? Well, it's just our very first uh, uh, problem. It's combinations of A, K to K. Okay? So how do we do this? What must be true for those K-specific arms, think about these three, to be the set of arms visited during the end trials? And here I'm reminded of Laplace's word. It's just common sense reduced to calculus. We immediately see, but we need to be very clear on what this sentence means. It's not, uh, well, let's see. What must be true for the red to visit only these arms during end trials? Two events must uh, happen, A and B. Event A is that each one of the visited arms is among the set of K. So each one of the arms that the rat visited, it's one of these. But that's not sufficient. Each one of these, each one of these arms was visited. So this may seem to be the same thing, but they're not. One thing is that I only sampled from this set. That's A. But when I sampled, I sampled at least once each one of them. That's B. Given that I sample from this set, I have to sample each one of the arms. Okay? And that's what makes the problem a little bit tricky, because we need to find the probability of A and B. Well, the probability of A is reasonably straightforward. Each one of the arms visited during the end trials must be in the set of K. So this means that the guy is sampling from the set of K arms. Well, suppose, for example, uh, the K w were equal to 3. If the red uh, samples from this set, the probability that on one trial it samples from the set, in this case, would be 3 over 8. In N trials, is 3 over 8 multiplied by 3 over 8 N times. So I'm just generalizing. If I want to make sure that the guy is just sampling from the K arms, well, the number of favorable cases is K. The number of total cases is 8. K over 8, it's a probability that I sample from that restricted set. But I want that for N consecutive trials. These are independent, and therefore I just multiply them all, and I get this. Reasonably easy. The hard part is what's the probability that when sampling during N times from this set, I sampled all of them, each one of them, at least once. Because otherwise, you know, I could be sampling from here, but at the end of N trials, I only sampled two of them. I was sampled from that set, but I didn't sample each one of them. Then I would have two different arms instead of three visited. Okay? So this is a tough probability. When you are faced in probability problems with a tough one, Think about the opposite. It may be easier. And then go back to the first. So that's another rule of thumb. Sometimes the direct attack is not the best strategy. Go around, try the opposite. So, event B given A, what's the opposite? Well, the opposite is event not B, but given A. What does that mean? Look, if event B means, I'll forget the condition. Uh, it's not very important right now. Event B means the red visited each one of them at least once. Well, what's the opposite? Well, missed one at least. Right? So, it must, the red missed at least one of the K arms. That's the opposite. This probability turns out to be easier to compute. So, if I figure this out, what I want is not this. I want the opposite. I just subtract it from one and I get the result. Okay. Now, we're going to define a random verb. Here we come again, terminology, enough to scare lots of people because A sub J's and X sub J's, uh, is, there is one good point in this terminology. It forces, we, it forces us to be clear what exactly are we trying to accomplish. It's abstract, that's the price to pay. Um, so, let's define A sub J the event. Arm J was not visited on any one of the end trials. The guy missed arm J. Okay? So, our event may be written in this way. Look, if you're trying to figure out the probability that at least one of the arms was missed, well, how can it occur? It can occur because the guy missed either arm 1, or arm 2, or arm 3, or arm 4. So, if this, what we're trying to find is logically equivalent to this. 
So the probability that uh, at least one of the arms was missed is the probability that arm 1 was missed or arm 2 was missed or blah, 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 up to arm K. We are, I'm restricted to K arms here. How do we find this? Well, you probably learned in high school the case where you just have two terms here, probability of A and B. And then sometimes the instructor assigns you the derivation of three terms. I'm going for the general thing and explain what is called the inclusion-exclusion formula. It's awful formula. But if you remember the name, you will never forget it. There is a purpose for this name. It was very carefully chosen. Our mathematician friends are very smart. So they gave it a very nice mnemonic name. You remember this, probability of A or B. You know the formula. It's probability of A plus probability of B minus the intersection. With Venn diagrams in honor of the uh, British uh, logician, uh, it's pretty intuitive. Notice all the colors did not come up very nicely, but notice the following. I want the probability of A or B. Well, A or B is the entire thing. Okay? So when I put probability of A, I'm adding one, the area 1 plus the area 2. When I put the probability of B, I'm adding area 2 plus area 3. But if I stop there, I would have added area 2 twice. I would have counted it one too many times. So the, I know that this probability is 1 plus 2 plus 3, because those are the three areas there. But if I go A, I have 1 plus 2. If I go B, I go 2 plus 3. Therefore, I need to subtract 2. That's why we get this subtraction. Now, seeing the problem this way generalizes very easily. Let's go to the third case. The three case, uh, unfortunately, well, okay. So, now pay attention to the, to the name, please. Here's the formula. Probability of A or B or C, you start by including each one of the probabilities, uh, taken one at a time. It's probability of A, B, and C. You add them. But then you need to exclude, not to overcount, the probability of the pairs. A and B, A and C, B and C. And then you need to include, again, the probability of the events three at a time. And this is so that you have counted each one of these areas only once. Okay? And this generalizes very nicely. Okay, this is the part that looks awful, but the logic is this. When you have probability of A1 or A2, blah, 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 you add the probabilities of the single events. You include them. How many are they? There are combinations of N, one at a time, which is just N. What about what you do next? Now you're going to exclude. You exclude the pairs. How many are, them, are they? Combinations of N, two at a time. Then you're going to include the triplets. Then you exclude the quadruples. And you keep including and excluding, including and excluding, until you reach the number n. The tough part is to realize how many are they, because this, there is a summation here. How many are they? Look at this pattern. n, one at a time, n, two at a time, n, three at a time. And because you are, I am including and then excluding, the sign is reverse. Okay. So, remember, we're trying to find the opposite of what we want. We want, our problem is reduced to finding this probability, okay? So, here's the formula. Probability of one at a time, then exclude two at a time, then include three at a time, and so on. Let's take step by step, one at a time. That will be easy. What's the probability that arm two, for example, is not visited during end trials? I have K arms. The probability that arm 2 is not visited, this means that I'm constantly sampling from the other arms. Okay? So, it's just k minus 1 over k. Okay? This is on one trial. If I have n trials, it's just the same thing multiplied uh, n times. So, I take advantage of another nice thing in the situation. There is symmetry. And what is true of arm 2 is true of any other arm. Okay? So, uh, here I have my first term. I'm going to build a table. This is the probability that I failed one of the arms n times. How many of these? One is related to the summation, the other to the probability. So I start to build my table slowly. Remember, many steps, each one relatively easy. Now, we need to go to the second term. And I need to hurry a little bit. 
Okay, what's the problem? We, in many of these problems, we start to see the pattern. So this is a sort of condition reinforcer here. What's the probability that a guy, for example, missed arm numbers two and three? That's the same problem. Just collapse them, tie them, it becomes one arm. But the number of the other remaining options is k minus two. So this means that the guy has sampled from the other k minus two arms for n trials. So on one trial, that probability is k minus two over k. Over n trials, it is this. What is true of arms two and three is true of any other pair of arms. So I take advantage of symmetry. And so here's a solution. That's the probability, and that's the sum. There are k pairs, two at a time. So now you get the picture. Notice the pattern. The combinations are k, one at a time, k, two at a time. You guess what's coming up next. k, three at a time, k, four at a time, up to k. What about there? You have k minus one over k, k minus two over k, k minus three over k, k minus four over k. And there is a beautiful pattern here. I've just filled the table completely. And you stop here at zero, okay? So if you do it systematically, there is no way that you're going to do more terms than needed. We plug this awful looking formula. Yeah, we can write it in a more concise way, but remember, this is not what we want. That's the opposite. So I need to subtract this from one. I get that, and each one of, uh, I mean, this looks awful, but you can compute one by one, and that's the solution to the problem. Um, some people see beauty where, where some see windmills, others see giants. So, um, Okay, so we can write it in a more abbreviated form. This is just a redescription of what's there. And then we plug the entire thing. We have divided the problem into parts. We have figured out the probability of each part. Let's recap what we have done. What did we want to learn? We want to find out, to learn what's the probability that after n trials, the number of distinct arms equaled k. We fixed the tension on k-specific arms. We determine the probability that these arms are the set of arms visited during the end trials. This is the hard part. And then, of course, this is just for k-specific arms. Well, we have eight, uh, combinations of eight k at a time. We put this together and we have our solution. Um, so, remember, the formula looks like this. Number of ways of choosing k arms times the probability of visiting only the set of k arms times the probability of visiting all k arms. I have to sample from that set of k, and I have to ensure that I sampled each one at least once. So, we plug the numbers, and Excel can do it, and I get the distribution for the radial arm maze, and you could uh, uh, compute the average. You know, intuitively, you know, we look there and see the average must be around here. Alton and Schlossberg refer to 5.25, and you can check that number right on the mark. They get it right. But um, um, I'm going to jump here. We c could do the same thing for Ellen Neuringer's results, and the number is correct. Once the, the nice thing, because it's the same thing, it's the same problem, except that Ellen was working with a radial arm maze with 256 arms. His problem is exactly the same. Um, okay, so we have uh, um, checked... Oh, hold on, let me, this was just a recap, uh, so I'll go a little bit faster. Sorry about this, I should have removed this. Okay, I want to conclude with the following thought. Many students, uh, when taking statistics courses and probability courses, have told me, for example, oh, I'm a little bit upset. I mean, the teacher only gives us these problems with coins being flipped, balls being placed in urns, and I was interested in the psychological problems. Uh, my reply to these students has two parts. The first one is, I understand that. Go back to your instructor, and I'm sure he or she can give you examples of how this applies to psychology. But do not despair. Many problems have the same structure. If you learn these problems that these guys have included for decades in introductory textbooks on probability, there is a good reason for them to be there. They have a structure that is similar. So if you learn the structure, if you, and then you vary that, uh, that's the type of problem, you will abstract the structure, and then when you see these problems, they have all the same structure. The solution to one is a solution to the other. So the, this is just like the radial arm maze. Or if you want, a radial arm maze is just a serial box problem. This is a famous one, 
And it's the Ellen Uringer's problem, if we assume that uh, pigeon is pecking randomly, it's just the same thing with 256 arm. Uh, so I'd like to conclude returning to the Marquis, uh, who said regarding the science of probability, Laplace concluded that there is no science more worthy of our meditations and that no more useful one could be incorporated in the system of public instruction. I doubt his first statement. I think psychology is still more interesting, but I fully agree with the second statement. Thank you. There's nothing wrong with simulating. There is something wrong with only simulating. Um, uh, first of all, uh, simulations can take time. Simulations are parameter dependent. And uh, I have simulated many times because I wasn't able to solve the thing. So one nice thing of this, uh, uh, it develops your intuition and it gives you precise results. For example, um, given the... Uh, uh, the final result on the distribution that we saw for the radial arm maze, I plug a different ar a number of arms and I get for Ellen Neuringer's case with 256. I can not only get the mean, I can get an, a confidence interval. And I have, for example, observed that in one experiment that Ellen and Paige did, uh, all the birds were within the 95% confidence interval of distribution. You could get that by the simulation. Uh, there is little in discrete probability they cannot simulate. But then you need to run lots of trials. And you don't, I don't think you get sometimes, unless you run lots of simulations, play a lot with it, you don't get the intuition. What is this parameter doing? What happens if I change this parameter? Number of trials. Um, and I think there is also an element of fun for s some people. So I think intuition, uh, a deeper understanding of what's going on. You could get it by simulation, but sometimes it takes a long time. Um, so how do you talk about spreading the probability out over time? Uh, I'll, I'm not sure I understood the question. How, what do I think about spreading the probability over time? Yeah, I think it's like if I conceptualize my problems predicting what the organism is going to do at 2 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, looking at it as a, as a temporal space, defining you know, where something is, um, then I'm going to be able to think about how to well, you know, that's a different sort of a type of problem I have not dealt with in one tutorial. I, didn't, I restricted my attention to discrete probability and more to very simpler cases like, you know, this stat pigeon is choosing uh, the keys with the same probability or the stat rat that is choosing the arms. And what I think it's important there is I don't know of any rat that behaves like this, but it gives you a reference point. For example, when Schlossberg tells us that their rats took, uh, after eight trials, visited on the average 6.5 to 7.5 uh, 7 distinct arms, I know what random would predict 5.25. I can compare it with the rats and say, gosh, these guys are really much better than the, what randomness predicts. But a different sorts of models uh, would lead us into continuous time and uh, serial dependencies, and these are much more complicated. I didn't deal with them uh, here. Matt? Matt? From my, what other tricks do you have in your bag? So you talked about addition on the first step. You talked about... Count the variables. I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question is, what tricks have I illustrated here or do I have in my bag? Uh, sometimes I didn't ma name them, but one of them is certainly expectation by conditioning that generalizes to probability by conditioning. In, when you have multi-stage experiments and you want to compute the probability at the end of them, you can say, okay, let's see what happens on the first trial. And many times you get recursive, like in the expectation. That's the first. Second is counter variables. One variant of the counter variables is what's called indicator variables, variables that can either be 0 and 1, and they are beautiful to count. I didn't have time to illustrate. Um, the other one is compute the opposite of that probability. The fourth one, if you want, break the problem in parts. Those are the tricks. 
I think uh, we don't have any time for any further questions.